In the age of gunpowder, wars were increasingly fought far away from the homelands of most soldiers. A soldier from Spain, for example, could move as far away as to Italy, France, the Netherlands or Germany, and even overseas to the Americas. The recruitment process and the long marches that were required to reach these distant theaters of war became more and more complex in terms of recruitment, administrative organization and logistics. In this video, we will have a look at how modern historiography explains how an early modern soldier made his way to the field of battle. In the early modern period, recruitment became entrepreneurial. European states at the time were characterized by an increasing centralization of power. Gone were the days when, stereotypically speaking, a feudal lord or noble knight would answer the call to banner by his king with a small company of footmen and a handful of squires. In the 16th century, states and princes enlisted a specific number of men under specific terms of service for a specified amount of pay. Expenses were covered by the state, the kingdom or a prince, always with the intent to keep the cost as low as possible. In military literature, the man in charge of the recruitment is usually referred to as a colonel. In actual fact, the title or rank of this person could vary. The colonel would select his highest officers, usually captains, and send them to particular areas where they should recruit a certain number of soldiers. The captains were often not only short on money, but also on a very tight schedule. In the Spanish army, for example, they usually had about three weeks from commission to the presentation of a ready regiment. In France, in contrast, it was common that the officers left for up to six weeks, went home and came back with a trail of recruits from family estates. When the recruiter arrived in a town, people from the nearby countryside were made aware of his presence by the beating of drums. This drew in potential recruits and onlookers alike. Dennis Showalter and William Astor, experts on this topic, described the ambience vividly. Quote, Recruiters usually held open house in taverns, seeking to create a convivial masculine atmosphere that encouraged signing an enlistment contract accepting the king's shilling, and sometimes merely drinking to the local ruler's health and at the recruiter's expense. End quote. The norm required to join the Spanish army is said to have been able-bodied over 16 and under 50, single and sane. Of course, there is reason to doubt the last provision. What is certain is that this form of recruitment not only drew in willing future soldiers, but also drifters who woke up the following morning with an aching head bound for glory under armed guard. Apparently, there were quite a few cases in which parents had to pay a colonel a substantial amount of money to get their sons out of military contracts they had signed in less than a sober mood. By and large, though, most recruits were at least willing to consider a life in the army and were not forced into it. There were multiple occasions when a colonel did not find enough men who were willing to join. Then he had to fill the ranks with so-called masterless men vagabonds, brigands or unemployed people. The Spanish government, for example, raised an entire regiment of them in Catalonia in the 1550s. From recruiting the men of the street, it was a short step to emptying the jails. Preferably, one did not take on thieves, alcoholics and brawlers, as they were a constant source of friction. The most favored criminals were debtors or smugglers. Especially smugglers were seen as the adventurous types who didn't really harm anybody in the first place, so they were welcome in the military. So, generally speaking, recruits were about 20 to 40 years old, with the men in their 20s making up the majority of the new soldiers. Showalter and Astor conclude, quote, with a few regional and administrative variations. This was the system practiced throughout 16th century Europe. It is worth noting, however, that later on practices changed from country to country especially Russia, Prussia and Sweden, developed different models over the course of the 17th and 18th century. The ultimate step to supplement early modern armies was compulsion. This usually meant some form of levy system of militia units. Normally, a militia was only called up in an emergency, by quickly recruiting men from local farms. Militias were not very effective, 
In many cases, they lacked the motivation to fight because they simply wanted to return home and care for their land and family. Usually, they didn't get any money either. So, there was no real benefit for them in going to war for a king they perhaps didn't particularly like anyways. One place, however, where peasant levies were quite effective was the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. This is usually explained by a martial spirit among the lower strata of the Polish-Lithuanian society and by the vast terrain of the Commonwealth on which improvised local levies could have strategical benefits. The famous cavalry of Poland-Lithuania, the Winged Hussars, also differ from other recruitment practices. Usually the Hussars consisted of volunteers from the Polish-Lithuanian nobility. All in all, militias and noble volunteers could play an important role, but in this video we want to focus on the recruitment of a normal mercenary. Whether a colonel could find a suitable mercenary to recruit for his army depended on two things, his reputation and his purse. For potential recruits, looked for a well-organized company with many veterans to lead the other men, so they stood a better chance to be successful in battle, and to return home in one piece. Equally important was the colonel's display of cash at the recruiting site and him giving generous bonuses. This suggested that the raised regiment would be paid reasonably well. The more money a recruiter had, the better the man he could recruit. In the most extreme cases, a recruiter could, with the right amount of money and reputation, raise an army from scratch. The defining figure for that is the renowned Albert von Wallenstein. He made himself a name as a leader during the Thirty Years' War and became so influential that the Habsburg Emperor made him retire because of his growing influence. However, a few years later, the Emperor found himself in a desperate situation when the Swedish King Gustavus Adolphus had destroyed his army at the Battle of Breitenfeld and ravaged the lands of Bavaria. He had no other choice than to ask Wallenstein to return. Wallenstein's reputation and money grew in mercenaries from all over Europe. Wallenstein, as a consequence, raised an army from scratch in no time. In the end, his newly assembled men took on the experienced army of Gustavus Adolphus at the Battle of Lützen in 1632. There, both armies suffered horrendous casualties. Gustavus himself was killed in action. It is disputed who won, because both Imperials and Swedes claimed victory but it is a testimony to Wallenstein's recruitment and strategical skills, that his army wasn't simply obliterated by the experienced Swedes. However, armies raised from scratch like Wallenstein's were rare. Usually, recruiters had well-established ties with their employers, sometimes based on religion, more often as a consequence of established business experiences. For example, Irish men gravitated to the colors of Spain and Austria, while Scots usually found themselves in the service of Sweden and Holland. Dennis Showalter and William Astor summarize, quote, Actual recruiting procedures were about the same, whether Scots were taking the coin of Gustavus Adolphus in 1630, or Frenchmen were signing on with a royal regiment in 1712, end quote. In any case, once a recruit accepted the token coin, he had the remaining evening to celebrate this liminal moment of his life with meat and drink. He better enjoy it, for soon he would find himself in a different world. Once the coin was accepted, the recruits were on their own until the time fixed for mustering, the moment when a regiment assembled for the first time. The recruits usually passed through a gate, sometimes made of pikes in front of the mustering officer, the regiment clerk and the legal officers. The officers called out each recruit's name and described his equipment and the pay scale accompanying it. A clerk, meanwhile, was noting down the information. Then the recruit received his first pay from the paymaster. This ritualistic process had at least two functions. Firstly, it was designed to stop corruption. Recruits couldn't borrow each other's armor and weapons to inflate their pay. Also, the recruiting officer had no chance to let the man pass through twice to inflate the roles and thus the pay from the state or prince who commissioned the recruitment. Secondly, the ritual was simply a public occasion. Such public occasions were very rare events in the lives of most men at the time. Most likely, it was the first time since a man's christening that he was, for a brief moment, in the center of everyone's attention. 
There was also social pressure to appear at the mustering. Not showing up might have been considered shameful and disgraceful by the community. But in all likelihood, nothing serious happened to recruits who did not show up. Soon after the mustering, the colonels began building a collective spirit among the soldiers. He would assemble them in a circle and read to them the articles of war under which the regiment served. The circle was a throwback to an earlier time, when so-called free companies made their own laws. In case of the Landsknechts mercenaries from southern Germany, the articles of war were quite extensive and listed all senior officers, various punishments in case somebody misbehaved and the details of payment. Generally, these articles spelled out the rules of behavior in the field and camp. This might also include rules about looting, which was generally forbidden except by direct order. Everything taken in friendly territory had to be paid for. Civilians had to be protected. These articles also regulated the payment of the soldiers. A delay of payday was one of the most common causes for conflicts. In general though, this wasn't considered a reason to relieve a soldier from service. Having heard the Articles of War, the regiment swore an oath to adhere to them. This procedure was more or less standard in the beginning of the early modern period, although it varied of course depending on the place and type of unit recruited. Scots, for example, were more strongly religious. Their recruitment often featured a sermon. Mounted units devoted their attention to such matters as the condition of horses and the responsibility for their replacement. Artillery units were very valuable commodities and did only very little recruiting as they were usually kept on retainer. On the whole, these practices remained somewhat consistent and even tended to become increasingly homogenized across the 17th century. After all these formalities, the newly recruited soldiers took their most difficult step as of yet, marching into the respective theater of war. For the individual, this meant physical and psychological challenges. For the army as a whole, the challenge was logistical. Europe's road network was thin to begin with, but most of it was simply not suited to transporting even small bodies of troops. Old roads and bridges collapsed frequently, in these cases, only chaos followed suit. Depending on the season and weather conditions, the arrival of armies could hardly be calculated with any kind of accuracy. Diplomatic and financial considerations too made them even less predictable. Moving a large body of troops, arguably, was one of the most difficult tasks in war, second perhaps only to actual combat. When they set out to their long march, many men were not in great condition at least by modern standards. Dennis Showalter explains that most soldiers were poorly fed and often sickly. While they could work for long hours, they were not well trained for the extreme physical challenges of a march with heavy equipment. Moreover, foreign food could literally devastate entire regiments, to say nothing of the impact of unfamiliar water on stomachs accustomed only to local bacteria. The immune system of soldiers were also highly localized. Today's childhood diseases like mumps and measles devastated entire regiments of soldiers who had no defense against these sicknesses. A newly recruited regiment could expect to have increasing bags to carry and more than a few bodies to bury. Far away from home, the men often faced a simple, but nonetheless really bad psychological foe, homesickness also called mal du pe or nostalgia. Some historians refer to this as resembling clinical depression, but it might be better understood as a reaction to being completely isolated or removed from anything remotely familiar. Having seen only the town or farm of their childhood, the man faced the psychological abyss of the unknown. Often this would lead to withdrawal and an emotional shutdown, even before reaching the field of battle. Naturally, many turn to drinking as a coping mechanism. As alcohol's deadening effect faded with increasing resilience, physical symptoms such as loss of memory, impaired speech and sleeping disorders popped up. While impossible to calculate, homesickness certainly increased losses in many new regiments. <laughs> 
One way of addressing homesickness was to ease fresh soldiers into the business of war in regions similar to what they were accustomed to. Spanish recruits, for example, were sent to Italy first, before they had to confront the windy, rainy and muddy grave known as Flanders. Italy was popular. It promised a mild climate, strong wine and easy women. While battle was as deadly in Italy as anywhere else, the ambience helped ease the man in. From there, the step to the Low Countries was not all that shocking anymore. Of course, not every state had a theater of war in mild climates readily at hand. These states had to season their recruits on the march by exercise. A particularly interesting example is the so-called Spanish Road. Spain needed to bring new troops to the Low Countries, today's Netherlands and Belgium. But the sea route was risky, because ships inevitably had to sail around France and came close to the Dutch fleet. In the end, the Spanish had no choice but to march their men from Italy all the way up to the Low Countries. To do so, they marched along a small number of parallel routes, collectively known as the Spanish Road. This was a logistical monstrosity and required many records, lists and accounts. Thanks to this laborious paperwork, the Spanish Road is very well documented. Each route was systematically mapped to indicate bridges, forts and supply centers. These supply centers were permanent and they were regularly restocked from local sources. Thanks to them, the soldiers did not have to plunder on the march. Although local suppliers would demand horrendous prices, it was vital that the men didn't resort to plundering. This would have led to diplomatic issues, most likely. In the middle of the road was the so-called ETA, a place where merchants delivered all sorts of supplies. This elaborate system hardly prevented all looting, nor did it secure lodging and food at the end of every day's march. But it certainly made the experience more tolerable. After their long march on the road, soldiers entered camp life, with all its luxuries like markets and brothels. But this is a topic for another video.